This is on the B650 Wi-Fi, a very affordable Chinese motherboard that is available for roughly 100 US dollars. And for its affordable price, it has a huge VRM with a huge heatsink on top of it. And since everyone loves things that punch way above their price, I decided to review this motherboard and check if it's really good or not. Let's begin. So, one of the key selling points of this motherboard that it is very affordable. At least in a place where I live, you can buy it for roughly 100 US dollars. And for that kind of money, you're getting a quite decently looking motherboard. Yeah, the colors are all brown and gray, just like Gigabyte likes to color its uh, low-tier motherboards, but it's looking good. I do not like the red-orange sign on the left, but it can be removed, as I will show later in the video. But unfortunately, for these kind of non-branded motherboards from China, you really have to check everything. Even the simplest things may just not work. Let's begin with the back panel that has six USB ports, two of which are 2.0 and the other three are 5 gigabit. It also has four video outputs, one of them is VGA. There's a BIOS reset button, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, audio inputs and outputs, and a Wi-Fi antenna. There's also a second BIOS reset button right beneath the CPU. The integrated audio chip is ALC897, which you can see on basically any cheap motherboard, so no complaints here. I would be more surprised if it was something else. And on the bottom you get front panel audio, a COM port, speakerphone port, smart and stupid RGB lightning ports, dual front panel USB 2.0s, USB 3.0, and three 4-pin connectors for fans, and all the case buttons and LEDs. There is no RGB software or anything in BIOS that allows you to control these RGB ports, so I guess you need to use something like OpenRGB or else I don't know how do you use these ports. On the right side there's only four SATA ports and there is no Type-C for the front panel on this motherboard, so if you really need one, this board is not for you. On the top there's another 4-pin fan header and 8-pin CPU power. So, PCI Express extension 4.0 by 16, this one is weird, these two are 4.0 M.2s each, and the bottom PCI Express is either by 4 or by 2, because in specification it's by 4 and the sign is by 2, so I don't really know which one. The CPU power delivery, the VRM, is kind of huge. You can see the radiators are quite big and it has a lot of phases. We will discuss the VRM just a little bit later, but know this, the top radiator may block you from installing certain certain types of cooling solutions on this motherboard, so be careful. As you can see, the VRM on this motherboard is quite massive. On the official website, it kind of says 10 CPU phases, which it absolutely cannot be. Let's try to decipher what this VRM really is. All phases consist of the same VRM components, which are on the screen. It has one top side MOSFETs and two low side MOSFETs. And honestly, for such an affordable motherboard, it's quite good. I'm not a VRM expert in any possible way, but I think these are good enough to handle basically anything you throw at them. If you are more experienced in these kind of things than I am, please leave a comment below if you think if this VRM is good or not. I'm open to any kind of discussions in the comment section. This rich tech a VRM controller is only capable of running 8 phases. So it looks like 10 power stages are combined into 5 phases running this controller. There's also one SOC phase and one miscellaneous face. And honestly, this kind of VRM for this kind of price with this kind of radiator looks very promising. I'll tell you how it did with 7950X later in this video. If you think I made a mistake, please comment below the video. VRM radiators are quite big, I really have no complaints regarding them, they're really good for the price. The only problem is the thermal pad, and I have been running one and a half hours of stress testing with 7950X on these VRMs, and these thermal pads are already leaking. These are the cheapest thermal pads you can get, so if you plan to run a hot CPU on this motherboard, I strongly suggest you replace the thermal pads. The M.2 heatsinks are, well, they're nothing exceptional, but they're here, so might as well use them, but they're really, really thin but I didn't expect anything better with such a price tag on this motherboard. Here's the motherboard completely naked. And you might already notice something weird, especially if you're working in board repair. Have you noticed it yet? If you're thinking chipset is kind of weird colored, then you're absolutely correct. The PCB color of a new chipset doesn't look this green. A new chipset has a bluish green color, and it becomes green if you try to resolder it to another motherboard. 
so there is a really good chance that chipset on this motherboard has been resoldered to this motherboard from some dead motherboard. And yes, I should have cleaned the dust before I filmed. Wi-Fi module. They, for some reason, didn't remove the protective film from this uh, metal thing that holds the Wi-Fi module inside. Placing the Wi-Fi on this motherboard is really simple. You just take out the module that is located in this metal box and replace it with something else. And it's something you should definitely do because the Wi-Fi module here is very cheap and slow. Replace it with something like Intel AX1200 or 1210 or some other Wi-Fi 6 module. I wanted to see if I can remove this sticker from the integrated backplate and it's actually held on by a huge amount of glue. So I guess you can replace it, just you'll have to deal with a lot of residual glue on the backplate, but it's totally doable if you really want to. Maybe you want to 3D print something in place. That would be also a really good idea. Before we power the board on, there's one weird thing that I stumbled upon while testing this motherboard. It refused to properly boot with my power supply. I had to replace it in order to test this motherboard and I couldn't understand why. It turns out some of the 24 pins were not connecting properly. That led to some really weird problems with the motherboard. I best guess that these pins are cheap or maybe not long enough. That's why they were not touching my, well, very much very very used test and power supply that I used, which led to these weird problems. But this power supply never had problems with any other motherboard. So if you have some weird problems with these motherboard, you may check your power supply. Maybe your 24 pins are not connecting properly. Just a weird issue that I've stumbled upon while testing this motherboard. Also there's one thing that I wanted to say before I start. The sleep on this motherboard didn't work. I had the latest drivers with latest biased version, but for some reason the sleep didn't work, so Windows did not want to sleep. If you critically need this function, please reconsider and buy another board. The BIOS is kind of default Chinese BIOS, it has only English and Chinese language, which is totally fine. If you've seen Chinese boards like Maxan, Soya, or Huananji, you're probably used to this bias. Chinese manufacturers may color it differently, but basically it's the same one. The GISA version is 1007A, which is quite old by the time I was making this video. It really just is an ordinary EUFI graphical bias, there's really nothing to discuss here. All the important bias options are here, unfortunately there is no profile saving, which you can see on basically any cheap brand motherboard nowadays, but here are a few things that I find annoying in these Chinese motherboards. First of all, there are no fan curves here. This is the way you control the fans, which is, well, a little not intuitive when you first see it. Yeah, an advanced user will probably figure it out in minutes, but it's still not very user-friendly. But if you are used to fan curves, well, you're probably gonna have a bad time. And here's the biggest problem. This motherboard doesn't like 3-pin connectors. If you are using 3-pin case fans, those fans will just work at 100% all the time. You cannot in any way configure them besides 100%. The board will only regulate PVM fans, which is unfortunate, unfortunately. There is resizable bar support in this motherboard and it's enabled by default. I personally haven't tested it, but Windows says the resizable bar is on, so should be working. So I took a 7950X and decided to see how good this VRM and can it handle this CPU. With this kind of VRM, it should definitely handle this processor without any problems, right? But before I even began the tests, I've stumbled upon a quite an unfortunate problem. This motherboard does not have a VRM temperature sensor. It basically only tells you CPU and chipset temperatures and nothing else. That's quite unfortunate actually. Before testing the CPU, I've decided to see if Precision Boost Overdrive works properly, and it does. There's really nothing to complain about, it just works out of the box without any problems. Then I decided to test frequency and voltage overclocking, and it also worked properly without any problems. So in terms of CPU overclocking, you can fully utilize the B650 chipset that allows you to do that. The voltage does drop a little bit when you enable stress tests, but it's nothing terrible. I did not notice load line calibration and bias, and I'm not sure if it's even there. Unfortunately, I did not take any footage from testing 7950X on this VRM, but after 20 minutes of Cinebench R23, the top of the VRM got heated up to 100 degrees, and the CPU began to throttle. That's without any cooling on the VRM. With at least some airflow on the VRM, this motherboard can handle 7950X without any problems. So this motherboard can handle any CPU you want. 
XMP and Expo apply just fine with this motherboard, but there is a huge problem. The timings on the screen are all the timings you can edit and there are some important timings missing, like TREFI. There's just no way to change them at all, even in Ryzen Master. And if you're thinking, well, just edit the BIOS like you can do on many Chinese motherboards, well, there's nothing here to edit. Everything is already enabled. They are simply just not there. My DDR5 modules had 6400 and 6000 XMPs, and both of them quickly failed stability tests but it doesn't mean yours will fail too. So the best I could do with manual overclocking is 6000 MHz with the timings on the screen. And as you can see, the TREFI timing was selected in auto by the motherboard itself. There's no way to edit it if you're into manual RAM overclocking. It doesn't mean that your XMP or Expo profiles will not work, but in my case, unfortunately, they did not work. But in my experience on this motherboard, if your RAM is above 6000, you will probably have to manually tune the speed and the timings of your RAM. So, what's the overall conclusion about this motherboard? Well, the main defining feature of this motherboard is the VRM, which is really good. There's really nothing to complain in terms of VRM, because it has a huge heatsink. It's capable of running even 7950X without any problem. Just make sure you have some case airflow. My biggest concern in terms of hot CPUs is the thermal pad, which you definitely need to replace. Cheap thermal pads leak oil and your VRM is gonna be fully covered in this oil if you use it long enough. My next concern is the chipset that is very likely been used before and have been resoldered to this motherboard from some other failed motherboard. You should definitely replace the Wi-Fi module. Wi-Fi 6 is so affordable now, you should definitely switch to Wi-Fi 6. There's also the bias timings problem and not very user-friendly way to regulate fan speed and three pins are not working. Yeah, this can be changed with BIOS updates and can be fixed, but still, yeah, this manufacturer does release BIOS updates, but will it? Will it fix the timings? I'm not sure. So can I recommend this motherboard to an ordinary user? No, definitely. If you are not exactly familiar with Chinese motherboards, I suggest you buy something like this ASRock motherboard may have a simpler VRM, but it can handle any 8-core CPU and it will have everything working. It will also support 3-pin fans, it will have a new chipset instead of using a used one, and it's also very affordable. And there are more very affordable B650 motherboards that you should buy. And as for this one, if you're an experienced user, if you've seen Chinese motherboards, if you really want to save and get a quite decent motherboard. Yeah, with some drawbacks, but a decent motherboard. I guess then you're one of the people who may consider buying this motherboard. But if you are an inexperienced user and just want to save a buck, this is not how you save it. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe for future content. Feel free to comment anything about this video in the comment section below and I'll see you in the next one.